Now, we've talked about the Malhama, we've talked about the civil war, we've talked about the Romans on one side and the Muslims on the other, we've talked about uh, uh, the conquest of Constantinople. There's one set of, of a hadith also left, and that is during one of these series of wars, or maybe before all of this begins, because we don't know, chronology is not mentioned, we do not know. Towards the end of times, the Muslims and the Romans will form an alliance against a third party. Now this is very atypical from the other ahadith, because all the other ahadith mention what? That the Romans on one side and the Muslims on the other side. Correct? So, in my humble opinion, and Allah knows best, these ahadith apply at the beginning of the Armageddon. Things are going to happen where Muslims and Romans will ally with one another. And then that alliance will be destroyed only to get worse and worse until the Mahdi and the Jal and Isa come. And Allah knows best. And during this time frame, people will convert from the Roman side to the Muslim side. Okay, what are these ahadith of this alliance and treaty? And also these are authentic hadith. Uh, this hadith is in uh, Abu Dawood. That Awf ibn Malik al-Ashja'i said, I visited the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the battle of Tabuk, when he was in the battle of Tabuk. And his tent was made out of leather. His tent was made out of leather. So I sat in front of the tent. The Prophet sallallahu gave me permission. He said, come in ya Awf. So, and this shows you how eager the Sahaba were that Auf was sitting outside and the Prophet saw him from the, from the opening. He saw Auf. He said, Come in, Auf. Auf said, Ya Rasulullah, all of me come in or only a part of me come in? Means, should I just stick my head in or do you allow my full body to come in? And yani, subhanAllah, the Sahaba were so particular of the permission. Like, what are you allowing me to come in? This is your private space, Ya Rasulullah. When you say, come in, are you saying, I fully come in? Or do you want me to just put in my head and talk to you? So the Prophet said, no, kulluk, yani all of you come in, your whole body come in. So, Auf came and he said to the Prophet, uh, sorry, the Prophet said to Auf, Oh Auf, count six things before judgment will happen. He gave him a prediction. Count six things before judgment day. Number one, Mauti, my death. Auf said, as soon as I heard that, I was shocked and saddened. SubhanAllah. We take, obviously, yani the process of not being amongst us, we take it for granted. We're born that way. For the Sahaba, they could not imagine a world without the Prophet. They could not imagine. It's something their mind could not conceive of. And that's why when the news came at Uhud, what happened? The Sahaba, they reacted the way they did. And that's why when the Prophet actually passed away, Medina was in gloom. As Anas said, we had never seen that sadness in our whole lives, right? So they could not imagine a world without us. So they never thought, you know, yani, may Allah protect all of our loved ones, but we can never imagine living without our loved ones, you know, with our parents. We don't, the world is there with them. Then when they go, that's when the shock comes to us. So the Prophet is saying, count six things. Number one, mauti. I said it was a shock to me. It was, what? My, your moat before his mind can grasp number two three four five six come out so he has to pay attention number two he said then uh, the Prophet saw him shocked he said count that as number one he's emphasizing the first sign of judgment day is the death of the Prophet that's the first sign his death is the beginning of a shot number two he said the conquest of Maqdis has that happened Yes, in Abu Bakr's time. SubhanAllah, Abu Bakr's last day of Khilafah was the conquest of Baytul Maqdis. And the first day of Umar, he received the Khilafah and the news of the conquest on the same day. Fathu Baytul Maqdis. And when he said this, it was impossible to even think of Baytul Maqdis being in Muslim lands. Wallahi, it is one of the biggest miracles of the truth of Islam that our Prophet and predicted these things and they took place within a year after his death. A year after his death, Baytul Maqdis is conquered. And if you really understand history at that time, this was impossible to conceive of. That this small group of Muslims in Medina who have not yet even conquered Mecca, 
and they're going to go conquer Bilad al-Sham and Bilad al-Rum and Bilad al-Faris. It's inconceivable. And yet within a year that took place. One of the most unexpected historical turns for Western historians is the rise of Islam. It is inexplicable. They cannot explain it. How could a group from their perspective of ragtag Bedouins come and disrupt human civilization, destroy the Sassanid Empire, carve out the Byzantine Empire, create a civilization that was even more glorious than the both of those previous ones combined? They don't understand how that happened. So for us, our Prophet said, number two, it will be the conquest of Jerusalem. Number three, a plague that will come amongst you and destroy your children and your wealth and property and it will purify your good deeds. Our scholars say this is the plague of Amwas in the 18th year of the Hijrah. There was a massive plague in the time of Umar al-Khattab. It was the worst plague of early Islam and they say this is that prediction. Number four, wealth will be distributed amongst you so much that if a person is given 100 dinars, he would not be happy. The Sahaba were very poor. One dinar was a big deal. A hundred dinars was a fortune to them. And we are now at a time when a hundred dinars is, yeah, okay, no big deal. We're, we're at this time now. Number five, there will be a fitna, a trial that will not leave any of your houses except that it will touch it. Our scholars say, in all likelihood, this is the fitna of the Sahaba that every single household was affected. Safin, Jamal, Aisha, Talha, Zubair, Muawiyah, Yazid, that fitan, that first war, the civil war that took place, they say this. Others say this might yet be another fitna that will happen. And then number six, and this is what we're interested in. Number six, there will be a treaty between you and the Romans. There will be a treaty between you and the Romans. And then they will betray you and march against you with 80 banners, under each of which will be 12,000 troops. In other words, 100,000 people. This hadith is in Ibn Majah. Another hadith mentions, another hadith mentions that you will form a treaty with the Romans and you will fight an enemy common to both of you. You will form a treaty with the Romans and you will fight an enemy common to the both of you. Then you will be victorious. And as you are returning back, one of the Romans will raise the cross on a mount and say, this has caused us victory. And a Muslim will get angry and destroy that cross, say Allah has caused us victory. And war will break out and the Romans will break their truce. And then this incident of marching against you will take place. So. These are only two or three hadith about this. That's it. But they predict another genre of predictions. And that is, there will be a third enemy. Who is that third enemy? Allahu A'lam. But it's neither the Muslim peoples nor the Europeans. There is another power on the rise. May Allah protect us from all of them as well. But anyway, this Allah knows whether that power will be the actual one. So, there will be a third race, a third group of people. You and the Romans will join hands in fighting them and there will be an alliance between you and you will be victorious once that enemy has gotten rid of been gotten rid of then the romans will essentially break their treaty with you because of this minor skirmish where a muslim said no it's not the cross and he destroys the cross and it's between two people but the romans will take that as an excuse to destroy the treaty and they will then attack you they will march against you with 80 banners now many of our modern scholars say this is must be a reference to the modern united nations or whatever i say allahu alam allahu alam but 80 flags 80 flags on one side every flag has a major 10, 12,000 people. That's a major war. So this is another prediction of a great Armageddon that will take place. And Allah knows best. Now, again, is this the Armageddon or is it one of them? Again, it's all cryptic. Allah knows best. It can also be said, and this is a valid interpretation. I'm not denying it at all. It can also be said that the final battle between the Jal and Isa will be an easy battle, not a difficult one and that the Muslims will not die en masse in that battle. And that will be a gift to Allah, to the believers. The hadith are not explicit. I'm simply saying it can be derived. How can we derive this? Because when the Dajjal sees Isa, what's going to happen? He will scream 
a loud scream and flee away and dissolve and Isa will kill him. Now, it could be said, another interpretation of all of these is the final battle is not the Malhama. The Malhama is the one before it, which is this one. The Romans and 80 flags on one side and the Muslims on the other. As for the actual final battle, it will be a gift. Why will it be a gift? There will be no resistance from the other side. You understand this point, right? You guys following? I've given you multiple interpretations. Allah knows best.